So the cosmonaut, he's the first man ever to go into space. He goes up in this big spaceship, but the only habitable part of it is very small. So the cosmonaut's in there, and he's got this portal window, and he's looking out of it, and he sees the curvature of the Earth for the first time. The first man to ever look at the planet he's from. And he's lost in that moment. And all of a sudden, this strange ticking. Keeps coming out of the dashboard. Rips out the control panel, right? Takes out his tools. Trying to find this sound, trying to stop this sound. But he can't find it. He can't stop it. He keeps going. A few hours into this, it begins to feel like torture. A few days go by with this sound, and he knows that this small sound will break him. He'll lose his mind. What's he gonna do? He's up in space, alone, in a space closet. He's got 25 days left to go with this sound. So the cosmonaut decides the only way to save his sanity is to fall in love with this sound. So he closes his eyes and he goes into his imagination. And when he opens them, He doesn't hear ticking anymore. He hears music. And he spends the remainder of his time sailing through space in total bliss and peace. Such a powerful quote from the inspiring movie Another Earth. Oh, I love that. That shows that you can do that with absolutely anything, can't you? You can, absolutely. That is just our, our situation here. Everything is unfolding as this inherently perfect melodic orchestra of life, that radiant, ecstatic outpouring that is just incomprehensible to our thinking mind. Life has allowed it in every possible way. Everything is as it should be. What you are isn't judging it. What you are is embracing it, loving it, just like soaking it all up. If you tap in just just momentarily to that larger picture and just take that view life has, which is free of the judgments, free of the interpretations, it is perfect. You're listening to the Non-Duality Podcast. This is Nick Hyam from nisagayoga.com. And here with me is Paul Dobson. I have this quite a lot during um, like my meditation times. There'll be some noise outside. The birds might be tweeting particularly loud or, you know, even, even something which is taken to be usually quite pleasant could become unpleasant. Or there's a dog barking in the distance or my own dog is barking. Uh, it's just a very, very gentle s- switch of perspective on that. And... You see it as a meditation bell, you, or you see it as music, or you see it as the divine harmony of everything just unfolding perfectly, just this orchestra just constantly rolling along in all of its forms. And it's a very subtle perspective switch. We have this idea that there's a thing called meditation, there's an actual doing called meditation where I'm sitting for a certain amount of time and it's meant to be in silence, and here's my time to be silent and be with myself and it's quiet and this is going to bring about peace but that's just made up nonsense really what this is is a time not even separate from the rest of life where i just decide to lie down for a while and experience whatever is arising and i relax and that's all that happens and then the dog might start barking in the middle of that and the dog barking initially was very frustrating (laughs) 
<laughs> because I'd get into some really nice blissful states and then the dog would bark and I'd be out of it again. Uh, but then because I do end up meditating with my dog there quite a lot, my, uh, I don't know, my feel of that sound and that moment and what was happening and the whole experience, I guess you could say matured, it became slightly different. So the dog barking was <laughs> at one point seen as him being a very fierce Zen meditation master. Like, look, you think there's this blissful state that that's all that's to be had, but here's life. Here is life shouting at you literally from the end of the bed. <laughs> what are you going to do about this? You can't shut it out. You can't shut it out forever. You can put your headphones on. It still won't shut me out. I'm barking away. There's a squirrel outside, so <laughs> I'm going to keep barking. Um, and as I was with it more, it became, it didn't become intrusive. It became almost like a reminder that everything is is that bliss, is that ecstasy that I was experiencing in those deeper states of meditation. But nothing had changed. But the dog barking was actually that outpouring as maybe a very sharp, short <laughs> version of that, but still just as much that. And it, it never left. It was still there. And that's extremely revealing. You can think that's a separate thing, an irritating noise that shouldn't be there. Or you can view the other side of it, which is that noise is there. Life knows what it's doing. It is the perfect unfolding of infinity to itself and an intelligence that is incomprehensible to the human mind, a beauty and melody and wonder. And at that perfect moment, the dog is making his natural sound that he does. And that is perfect in every way. And there's no, absolutely no need to judge it whatsoever. <laughs> there's no need because it's not judged, it's allowed. So there's, there, if, if within that, there's a thought that says this shouldn't be happening. But that's only a thought. It's just as much part of the flow of the perfection of unfolding as everything else. You can let it be swept along with the, with the river of that flow, swept along with the music of life, the unfolding of the perfection. And from that perspective, the dog barking is not just not a problem. It's just absolutely as it should be. <laughs> so it's a really, it sounds, you know, if you're used to doing meditation practice or things like that and used to your little um, sort of time that you've put to one side and that's where you sit in silence and you tell the family not to disturb you for that time. This seems like a really weird idea, but it's not. It's, it's only an ego mind, only a thought, only that function, that tiny, tiny little judgmental function would say that is not allowed, or say that is other than life, it say, say that it should be this way and not that way. And I, I, for a while, I really was pissed off with my dog doing this to me. <laughs> but now I'm grateful that he does this because he was, he's shown me a lesson He's shown me that, you know, you can't shut life out. You can't take one part of life and put it in a vacuum and then to have the rest of life just be out there somewhere. That's just more of the same game of duality, isn't it? Yes, exactly. But that's what kind of came to mind when I watched that clip of um, Another Earth that you showed me. And everything is that actually beautiful symphony it sounds crazy when someone says something like this, like because it go you know, well, you know, there's lots of horrible things in life, but that's only from a certain vantage, a certain perspective, from generally from a small egoic point of view. So you just got to look. Is my perspective one of total being in alignment with that flow? You could say totally being in the Tao you know, total alignment with that flow of this unfolding? Or is it one of rejection, denial of the unfolding? Is it one that I know that this is wrong? <laughs> if you're making something wrong, you can guarantee that it's always not in alignment with that flow. It's it's always an attempt of some kind to resist the flow. You can't actually resist the flow, but it's always a, and that's why it hurts <laughs> because you can't actually resist it. You're um, sort of attempting to 
tell life what it should be doing. And there is this element to it where there's total trust. In certain religions, they might talk about faith. And there is an element of faith to me where you start seeing how life is, how it's unfolding, what it is inherently uh, in a deeper way. And you, you do trust it because it does know what it's doing. Not in an intellectual way, but because it is good, because it's built on love, because it is built on inherent goodness, it knows how to unfold itself to itself in perfect ways. And so we don't need to attempt to resist that or reject it or deny it. There's no need. You can just relax and let it sweep you away, basically. You can just get swept along by it. And of course, there's no you separate from that thing that's sweeping along there's no use separate from the, the river but the the trust in it may allow you to see that the trust may be a doorway the faith may be a doorway if you allow yourself to be swept you may then see that you always were the river um but yeah that's kind of what that brought brought to mind when i heard that that lovely little clip from another earth you showed yeah the way life is manifesting is not at all problematic if there is a problem, it's a distorted perspective of that perfect flow, life expressing itself through experience. That's how life expresses itself. That's how life knows itself, remembers itself through experiences. And as we always say, no experience is foreign. No ex experience is outside of the flow or as a hindrance within the flow. What is in the flow of experiencing is seamlessly at one with each experience. Thought comes in and says, it shouldn't be like this. There are good experiences, bad experiences. But if you actually, rather than trying to stop thinking or change thoughts, or even reframe how you see things, because that's, that's a nice trick uh, it's, it has relative value but rather than doing anything rather than trying to change what's here rather than trying to think differently about here only be aware and you already are always only experience and you can't not experience what already is the case what already is the case is that even if there are problematic thoughts or thoughts that are making things to be a problem see that you are experiencing those thoughts, those thoughts are experiences and those experiences are expressions of that singular, indivisible, unbounded, eternal capacity of experiencing called I, called self, called nothing, no thing, being, becoming everything. Nothing is a problem when you see that nothing is apart from what you are. See that you can't actually resist the flow. You can't push anything out. Try to push out something you're currently experiencing. Try to stop the unfoldment, the present moment unfoldment. Try to change it and see that you can't. And see that you don't need to because nothing is at odds. No experience is at odds with what you are as this indefinable space of receptivity and not only receptivity but that which is received into you you're both what you experience and the fact of experiencing and then all becomes music each note has a certain quality a certain characteristic and that's all part of this this music um you don't need to change it. You don't need to resist it. If anything, just notice that all is exactly how it should be because it, right now it can't be any other way. It can't be any other way. There's a certain inevitability of this present moment experience. This present moment experience can't be any other way. There's a sort of suchness about this. So therefore it's appropriate, even... The darker notes, the heavier, denser, more contracted notes, so to speak, see that they are held 
that they appear in some context, and that context is not at war. The context is not finding the content to be problematic. It happens to be the case that you are the context and the content. So how can this be anything other than unthinkable perfection? The music, the dance, the exquisite artistry, creativity of life, of you. Just discern the nature of experience. Then you'll find that the nature of experience, you know, it's free of any kind of definition and it's free of any kind of conflict, any true conflict. So this is the harmonious, abundant flow of being. Sorry, sorry, mate, the door's gone. Talking of which. (laughs) Even the dog barking, apparently. (laughs) Got a live example now. Uh, I bow to Master Rupert. (laughs) Many bow wows to you, Master. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) yeah there's no there's no conflict in conflict ultimately conflict is an idea and actually in in some ways ironically when you see what it really is there is no conflict (laughs) it's like a self-perpetuating idea but when you see what these things really are you know delve deeper into the feeling texture of them the energetic output of them the the sort of vibrant aliveness of all of it. You see, there's actually no real difference between any of it. Ultimately, one inseparable arising as one inseparable flow, that indefinable ecstatic energy. Calling it ecstatic energy is probably the best I can do. It's like it's like, you know, the electrical, blissful, ecstatic life force. That is everything that is appearing is all manifestation inexplicably. It is arising inexplicably with no possible way of being defined or explained or or measured ultimately. It's just it just is. And that is always, always the case. That is inherent in absolutely any experience, any appearance whatsoever. And so it's always findable. The lines are not really there. <laughs> The lines between the good and the bad are not really there. The lines between pleasure and pain aren't really there. We we literally make things up on the fly. It just takes a little bit of sensitivity and noticing. That's all. It doesn't take anything fancy. It it just is. It's just like, where am I denying this in some way? Where am I saying that this is not the case, basically? Exactly. Where am I denying it? Where am I overlooking the fact that reality loves how it appears. It's said that Shakti, which is the ecstatic expression of God, of of reality, has five faces. So it manifests as the power to be, to be conscious, the power to feel ecstasy, bliss, the power of will or desire. And that's when it becomes problematic, (laughs) apparently. And the power to know and the power to act and doership. And all of those faces are God's faces. God may seem to go to war, be in conflict with God's expressions, but that's another expression, that's another experience you, God, is having. So this is one source being, becoming as all of this. The source is equal to the effect of the source, cause and effect to one. It's not like there was this initial big bang and then there was this process of evolution. That's one way of talking about it. That's that's the story and it's fine. It's happening now. This creative spark sparking and seemingly evolving, it's all happening now. There's only this moment so this is why we always say any experience can serve as a portal into the heart of reality any experience any experience take any experience and when you find that an experience points to nothing but that then there's no problem if there seems to be a problem then you recognize that that sort of habit of 
experiencing things in a problematic way is made of nothing but that. And that's not a bypass, that's discernment. That deep diving into the actual non-material substance of this ocean of life, which yeah, is always accessible, always accessible. Any experience will do. This also reminds me of the amazing text, Sing Sing Ming. I know we've spoken about it, we've touched on it in the past in a, in a previous episode. It says, the great way, which is life, is not difficult for those who have no preferences. What it's saying there is that the great way has no preference. And it's an invitation to recognise that you are the great way. And as such, you don't discriminate. Notice that you don't discriminate. You're not fighting. It says when grasping and diversion are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. And again, you can read that and or hear that and conclude, oh, I have to stop grasping and aversion. But that becomes a new grasping. <laughs> you start to be averse to your aversion. And it's a loop of suffering and seeking, which you're you're done with. You, you, you're done with suffering and seeking, being identified as, as that seeker and being characterised by what you seek and how you suffer. You're done with that. So just see that life doesn't grasp. Life is not averse to any way it appears. And you are that. Everything is clear and undisguised, which is why this is often referred to as the open secret. Open. It's accessible. It's absolutely here. It's absolutely this. And it says, if you wish to see the truth, and I'll just paraphrase, see that life holds no opinions for or against anything. And this is only about discerning the deeper nature of things, of experiences. Recognise consciousness's essential peace is no longer disturbed it's, it's seen as it, it never was disturbed it was always at peace that consciousness that you are that way the way that is perfect like vast space when nothing is lacking and nothing is in excess there's a an amazing balance of each shade every note every flavor it's all in balance and it's it's an invitation to see that to recognize that to return to the root of any experience that appears to you now is to find the nature of that experience. But to pursue appearances, to stay on the surface, so to speak, is to miss the source, miss the reality of things. So this is really not about a doing, a changing, a transforming, an evolving, a reframing, only about noticing what already is. Just notice, just notice what already is the case, what already is. And you'll find that you are always in love with what is literally love in love with yourself. It's a different view on things, isn't it? It's not like we have to um, build up some love. It's actually noticing that the love is inherent. It is existing. It's a fact. And then the degree to which we notice that and it's more like a lack of denying, I could say. This allowing isn't, it's not like a, a trying, a doing, an effort for what I'm going to allow now. I'm really going to do it. It's more like I am just not going to deny this now. It's, it's not even that, you know, it's kind of a, um, <laughs> if you see the nature of things, if you see that that love is inherent already, even if you just tap into a little bit, a little bit, it does itself. It you naturally allow as that because it kind of like there's no there's no resistance to it anymore because you to bring this word up again. There's a trust there though. There's a trust. There's a trust that goes. Oh, I don't need to hold on anymore. And it's a, it's a totally, totally natural process. It's, it's like it's a process of some kind that's doing itself. It's not that we have to, we're so used to making effort to do things. We're so used to trying and making things happen. It's actually like the opposite in some ways. It's, it's a total, total trust of life. Life has got you. I mean, life has, you are totally held, totally loved just by being. Because you are that. 
and life loves itself. So you can't be separated from that. So if you can just even see that in any small way, you relax a little bit and you realize life is completely, it's got it under control. (laughs) There is no control, but life's got it. Whatever is needed, life has got it. It's fine. The more you can see it's fine and the more that you can see all is well, regardless of how it seems to appear in your pre-programmed interpretations of what's appearing, you are just open to it. You're open because as life, you already are open. <laughs> but then as as the identity with a human you are not. <laughs> it would be quite, in some ways, quite accurate to say you're not if you are de- identifying yourself as the ego, as this just this human body. It could be said that you are in some ways in denial of, of that flow. It can never truly be denied. There is only openness, only the flow, only total love outpouring. But you can seemingly, if you have put your focus on this human being on this human mind, on this human way of uh, perceiving this particular perspective, you you could say that there is a a denial of that. There is an attempt to resist that in some way. So then it's just a shift of focus. That awareness, that life can choose, it seems, to shift its focus into this condensed little contracted ball of resistance as a human ego. And then it can relax that and go back into what it already is. It never actually leaves itself, but it's trying out. It's almost like it's trying out different zoom functions. It's trying out almost different ways of perceiving itself as life. And the only real truth is that it is always that open, allowing, unconditionally loving, blissful, ecstatic force. But it can try, try on maybe the clothing of the human for a while. Just zoom in the focus. And it seems to be like that for a while. But all that's needed is really just to notice what is already the case, as we always say. And it seems it sounds it sounds too simple though. It sounds too simple. And I do understand how it sounds. It um and it can be frustrating if you're in a difficult situation and you feel like you're suffering and someone says, just notice what is already the case. And you go, well, <laughs> What is already the case is I'm having a terrible time. So, but because it's never left itself, because it's made of that, it can't change its substance. It's always that substance. You can feel into this moment, even if you're having a terrible time, quote unquote, and you can feel what is that alive force? Just maybe just even feel where it's contracted in the body. Can you feel that? Can you feel where your muscles are tense? in the body that's you literally resisting this love force from fully expressing from fully allowing it through what you might say is your system not separate from the love not separate from the river but this system of a human being you can feel where you are holding on to some idea that that is not inherent that that is not what you are that you are suffering you are just this tiny little thing that that can be squished that is suffering and the world is against you you can literally feel that as a contraction in the body. There's like a correlation in the body. Even as a doorway, you can just maybe relax those little points in the body where you you feel that that's happening and just ease into it. <laughs> because it's already, it already is saturating your entire being and there's an attempt to reject what can't not be. <laughs> and that attempt to reject it creates pain. It's attempting to reject the inevitable. It's attempting to reject what already is the case. And of course that appears as tension in the body because it's because you're trying to do the impossible, basically. It's the it's <laughs> and it's a self-correcting system. So it you notice the pain, you notice the the tension, and you can relax for a minute, it's allowed to flow through. If you do this for a while. And eventually you see that even the tensions are it. <laughs> and then it's, the tensions are allowed to be there as well, but they kind of just release by themselves. Absolutely. Where there's tension, there's an aspect of the body, which is to say an aspect of your experience, calling out for attention. Attention. It's saying, look, feel me, include me, embrace me, I'm here. And then you 
make way for it, you sit alongside it, you hold it in your awareness, you start resisting it, what happens? That tension begins to relax because you are aligning with the suchness of it. You're not avoiding it, denying it, overlooking it, fighting it. Where there's tension, there is this interplay of the dualizing agents of desire and fear, push, pull, grasping, aversion. When you make space for it, you embrace it and that embrace softens that tension. You know, it, you could say it unifies your experience. It's again, it's seen to be what is there. It's seen to be already there. It's already here. Your awareness isn't saying no. Awareness always says yes. Awareness is literally saying yes to everything you're aware of. Just sit with that for a moment. Awareness is saying yes to everything held within awareness. There's no effort required there. Can't you see that everything you are aware of is already held within that infinite field? So a question often comes up in these sorts of conversations. How do you let go? Well, you see that you don't hold on. As life, as awareness, that's just the word. You don't hold on. I mean, you embrace what's here. And then you naturally release what's here. That's the nature of awareness. I mean, I'm talking about the existing awareness you already know so well. Like the, this normal awareness, not some new awareness, not some so-called enlightened awareness, special awareness. I'm talking about the existing awareness. Just look, look, it doesn't hold on to anything. So you don't let go. You, the individual, you can't let go, but you, awareness, never hold on. So that's how you let go, so to speak. You see that you don't hold on. How do I accept? How do I become a, a more accepting person? Well, the person is resistance. So if you're asking how do I, the person, the individual, become more accepting, that's not going to work. But if you realise that you're not the person, that the person is an experience, an experience you're free of, an experience you're prior to, you're behind, you're the foundation for, but also the power that animates it, then that's it. You recognise that you are allowing as part of your nature. Why would you not allow something you create? You create all this as life, as life, as awareness. So, there is no no, there's only a perpetual yes. Sri Atmananda says, you do not know anything but yourself. You do not love anything but yourself. So both knowledge and love have yourself as their object. Therefore, you are pure knowledge and love. When you tap into that existing allowance, you find that that's the only allowance that you can trust and you, like, you can put your full wholehearted faith in that you literally manifest and saturate this moment exactly how it is no matter what it is no matter if there is a tapping going on that is causing irritation that well see that you're not at war with neither the the tapping nor the irritation as life brahman means one who is all-pervading. That's what the word Brahman means, one who is all-pervading. You know, we often hear in spiritual teachings, Brahman is an infinity, Brahman is eternity. Brahman is this transcendental reality, the ceaseless nothingness, the one who is all-pervading. That means whatever is here is, is pervaded by that, by that Brahman that you are. It's not that there's some transcendental Brahman and something else called, you know, just crappy human experience. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, you know, you already are that. You already are awareness. You already are the perpetual 
yes with no opposite. You already are that. So, you know, as far as letting go, as far as surrendering, that, that is for surrender, is seeing that. Just look around this moment right now. Look around your room. Look around wherever you are. Notice how it's all said yes to. Even the thoughts that might say no to it have been said yes to. That's how, that's how unconditional it is. It's so, so allowing that it just says yes to absolutely everything. That, so that's already the case. That is already is totally allowed. But you can actually bring your human experience into alignment with that, which is, I think, something wonderful, really. You can just see that the human sometimes is saying no to things, but unnecessarily. <laughs> it's just nonsense. Well, not even unnecessarily, it's just nonsense. This is really what it is when people say, this is the true meaning as far as I'm concerned is what pe- when people say um, you can either choose love or fear in this moment. The love is the, the already existing yes of awareness of the Dharmakaya or of Brahman, what, of reality, of life. The already existing yes. It's already said yes to everything because, because it's perfect, because it's incomprehensibly loving. I mean, just not even, you can't even begin with your mind <laughs> You know, it's just beyond, beyond, beyond. It's already so loving because it is itself. It's the only thing that exists. It's bootstraps itself into existence and it loves itself unconditionally because it is. It, it knows what it is as infinite amazingness, you could say, <laughs> to put some words to it, which aren't either, which also aren't accurate. But so that's that's already the case. And so where... Where is that being denied in some way? <laughs> That's already the case. So how can we possibly deny that? It's like we're grasping onto grasping onto thin air, essentially. So it's not that you do something to let go. You see, see what's already true. And then the grasping completely inevitably stops because there's no... The grasping only comes from a, a belief that... You are a separate individual that has all this fear and needs to get stuff from outside of yourself in order to make yourself okay. But if you, in this moment, knew with full comprehension in every way that you are absolutely everything that you seek. I mean, it already is inherent with you. Like the jackpot, the, as John said, the cornucopia, the treasure chest is already what you are. And so therefore looking for stuff outside of yourself to get more of that is is, um, obviously nonsense. If you saw that with full comprehension right now, there's nothing to grasp onto. There's no need to hold on in any way. It's a difficult thing to talk about, you know, because any way I talk about it makes it sound like there's some subtly in some way there's something to do called letting go or surrendering or and maybe it does look like that at one point. Maybe it does look a little bit like some something that gets the ball rolling. But actually, it's it's seeing the the inherent yes <laughs> that you spoke about. I like. I really love that. The, the yes, it is saying yes unconditionally to absolutely everything you're experiencing right now. Your full field of experience in every possible way. Is, has been said yes to. So seeing that, of course, you are lined up tr- completely with that yes, that is, a, that is already there. I mean, it, in, in AA, you know, in, in addict groups and AA and groups of that nature, they obviously teach um, the 12 steps and a big step is surrendering to a higher power, surrendering to God. And that just shows the person can't do this. The person cannot do this. And that's taken to the extreme. These people are like at the end of the line. Um, speaking personally as well, you know, you can't, I could not do it. I could not stop taking the damaging substances I was taking. So I tried. I tried so many times. You know, I tried doing loads of yoga and all this kind of stuff and doubled up my meditation and things like that. And it, the more I tried, the, the more it was just kind of more resisting it was more like 
adding energy to it. And it was just a complete, in the end, it was complete hopelessness that um, was the only way forwards. It was a complete and total realization. I can't do this. I just can't because the person can't do this. The person is in a lot of ways for contraction. The person isn't a force by itself. You can't do it through sheer willpower. And seeing that, you're you then you're in the foot in the door to, in this context, the foot in the door to healing to recovery, because you can see that actually I just need to I I have got no other choice but to completely hopelessly surrender to that higher power that they talk about in AA, and that's that higher power is actually what we there's not not a different thing it's not some other thing that we're talking about to that's awareness you know experience the the experiential fact that's saying yes to this moment right now you surrender quote unquote surrender to that surrender to think to the thing that's already free of all of it that's already said yes to everything that's already completely completely loving then you naturally naturally the person is is freed <laughs> from because the person only ever is the contraction it's like a fist that's been clenched up for you know 30 years or something trying to unclench itself and what this is is kind of allowing it's like almost like dipping the fist that's been clenched all this time into just a warm bath and allowing it to unfold because it's relaxing and the warm bath is what you are the warm bath is like awareness who hasn't been touched by the experience of addiction to some degree i mean nowadays we're glued to our devices aren't we always checking always you know scrolling infinite scrolling seeking something but also those of us who've experienced profound uh, compulsivity and often what determines the degree of addictive behavior is the extent of trauma we've experienced to be human is to be sort of individuated as, as a human, to to be born into duality is, let's face it, that's 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 traumatizing. It, it can become very painful to be to exist. At least that's how the mind interprets existence. So, addiction is attempted reconnection. We all seek connection in some way, and really, what that points to is that we we seek to remember who we are because we are that indivisible connectivity uh, that's absolutely what we are that's the truth of what you are so there is a very skewed distorted wisdom in addiction addiction doesn't solve anything it doesn't ultimately bring you connection it doesn't put an end to this sense of separateness it actually perpetuates it it reinforces it if you're not the individual, then who are you? And when you realise that you are experiencing the individual, you are that life itself, then you wake up to what already is. You wake up to truth, and that is you are that seamless connectivity. When you align with that experientially, then you know that's the healing. That's the end of the compulsivity. The end of the individual self as an identity but that bunch of patterns that is the individual self doesn't evaporate into nothingness some of those patterns may continue but you just know that they're not you you're not invested in them you're invested in truth and you realize you can't not be invested rooted in what you are in truth that's the thing and you see how that doesn't work. You see how it doesn't work. And from there, you can kind of look into, well, what, what is that? You know, what, what am I looking for here? What is it that I'm looking for exactly through these, through the substances or the acts or whatever it might be? What is it that I'm trying to get? And ultimately, you're searching for yourself. You're searching for what you already are. You're searching for what is already inherent within you. What you don't realize through your own innocence is that the relief can't ever be found. 
And if you're fortunate, you will turn around at some point and go, this clearly isn't the way. <laughs> I'm clearly off track here. And you look into yourself, ultimately you'll see, I am the thing that I was looking for. You know, it's of, often a lack of self-worth, self-hatred, a feeling of disconnection. It's a feeling of unsafety. It's a feeling of fear. It's all of these things and more. And what you are is safety itself. All of the self-worthiness is here. Just absolute worthiness. I mean, unbelievably worthy just by being. When I say absolute, I mean untarnishable, indestructible, just can't be messed with in any way. You are absolute worthiness, absolute safety, absolute love, absolute joy, actually, and absolute bliss and peace. And all of those things that you're searching for outside of yourself is here. And the searching outside creates this fun house or not so fun house mirror version of reality where there is an almost a pseudo reality created where there's a, str a strong belief that that is going to get you what you want, get you what you are. And that reflects back to yourself as reality that I'm not enough. I'm not worthy. I'm not safe. I'm not loved. I'm full of fear. I am completely lacking self-worth. I am just not enough, basically. It creates that reflection. The more you seek outside of yourself for these things, the more that reflects back as, as a kind of pseudo truth. <laughs> and the more you come to see that it's already inherent with you, in you, already there, already impossible to be separated from you, the more you see that it's just, it just can't be found out anywhere else. It doesn't need to be found anywhere else. Exactly. Perhaps we get hooked because we, as individuals, find it hard to bear our individuality divided in duality. That's a state of, you could call it dukkha, which means, just means suffering, unhappiness, unsatisfactoriness, pain, stress. And that seems to characterize human existence, doesn't it? There's another word dysphoria, hard to bear. And so what do we do when we're in a dysphoric mood? We seek euphoria. So we go to the other extreme. And that's where addictive substances and activities come in, which give us a taste of euphoria. We try to equalize. We try to escape our experience. We're in this dysphoric state and then we go to the other side. And then once that euphoric state is finished, because it, it can't go on forever, <laughs> otherwise it would kill you, you then go back to the opposite dysphoria, the heaviness, the darkness, the depression, the unbearability of, of living as an individual. So what is the antidote? What is the answer? Because you don't want to just yo-yo back and forth. It's not sustainable. It is to realize that you bear it all and no experience is unbearable. Because even if you are experiencing what you call an unbearable experience, you're bearing that. You're bearing that because you're aware of it and it, you're holding it as awareness, not as an individual. Because the individual can't hold anything. The individual is that pain, that constant seeking. So you are fundamental. You are that which is the ground in that experience of unbearability. You're holding it. Just to realize that you are holding it. You don't have to jump to euphoria. You're holding it. Even if you can befriend it a little bit just by saying, yeah, I, I see you, you're here. I'll make space for you as much as I can right now. You change your relationship with it, that aspect of experience that is heavy, that is dark, that is dense, that is painful. You realise it doesn't define you and you realise that it's made of you. So you define it because it's made of you. It is of your nature. 
when you realise that, there's no need to escape. You realise that you can't escape and you don't need to escape. And where would you go? Wherever you would go would be only you, would be only reality. That's all there is. There's only one reality. So you can't escape yourself because you are reality. You don't need to escape yourself. Yeah, it is that wanting to escape that is actually the thing that hurts in the end. It is the wanting it for it to be other that it actually hurts. It's not, it's not the experience itself. It's not whatever's happening. It's the wanting for it to be other. It's the impossibility, basically. You're projecting into a future or remembering a past where it is different. And you can't. You can't be in that different experience. You're trying to create an impossibility. And that hurts. It's only the rejection of it that hurts which is interesting. It's not the experience itself. Even intense experiences, strangely, we have really investigated. It's, it's only re- the rejection of them that hurts. The tensing, the contraction, the rejection, whatever form that takes, is always the suffering. Yeah, it's the artificial no. Yeah, the artificial no is what hurts. That's a really good way of putting it. The artificial no, that's why it hurts. Because if it was a real no, that would be a totally different thing. That would be, you know, but it's an, it can never be a real no because life doesn't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't know. Just surrender, Paul. Just, you can't do it. No, <laughs> I can't, I can't do it. Life doesn't know. Life is knowing, knowing, no, no. <laughs> life only knows. And life only knows yes. Yeah. There is no, there is no no to life. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, let me just give up. stop.